Well, Chuck, if you say something during the message, <laughs> I'll know that it's you and not the Lord. <laughs> but that was, that was good. It was, it was the truth. Save lives. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know, laws have changed since some of us have raised kids of that age. I did not know that you had to have a brand new... To donate it. To oh. donate it. Okay. Yeah, because those are. You can still hand it down in families and that yes. stuff. Okay, yeah. I was going to say. But for us to accept it. Would know that. The people who work there. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you know, we. I think we raised our kids with everything that was either donated, donated or secondhand, or in no some way. Ever. It's like. Wow, well, I wouldn't have made it through if everything had to be new. <laughs> Expensive proposition. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn in them to the book of Philippians as we continue in this series. We're in chapter 2. We'll be looking at the last set of verses this morning. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we come this morning and... Again, thank you for the, just the beautiful weather, the beautiful spring that is upon us. We pray for safety among uh, farmers as they're out in the fields now and preparing and then planting. But we're so grateful that as the seasons roll around, we see this newness of life and it reminds us of the newness of life that we have through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we turn to your word now this morning, we, of course, know that it's the Holy Spirit who is ultimately our teacher, and we want to give him complete freedom and openness in our hearts to teach us what you would want us to know this morning. I pray that if there's anything that I have misinterpreted or say this morning, that is not truthful, that you would just take that away from our minds. And the things that you want to impress on us, uh, that the Holy Spirit would do just that. Thank you, Father, for uh, your word in this time to look at it in Christ's name now. Amen. So educational psychologists virtually all agree that imitation is one of the most effective means of learning of all the different ways. When we watch someone else who acts as an example to us and then we imitate them, we are much more likely to grow in whatever that particular activity is that we're watching. It just stresses the whole idea of the importance of examples in our life. God made us that way. And certainly, he knew all this. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, among other things, to be an example to us. I'd like to uh, have you participate here for just a moment. We haven't done this in a long time. Would you turn to the person next to you and answer just one quick question? Who has acted as an example for you in spiritual things. Now, don't say your mother or father. Let's rule them out. <laughs> but who in your life has been a particularly good example in spiritual things? Turn to the person next to you and give them just one name this morning. Who would that be? I hope you've been able to think of somebody. Um, I hope there has been somebody in your life that in some way has been an example in the gospel and in spiritual things for you. And as we turn to our passage this morning in 
chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 17 through the end of the chapter, verse 30, what we're going to see here is three examples. Paul is going to list three examples, three men who set the example in their own lives. And the first one is Paul himself. This is in verses 17 and 18. Follow along. Paul says, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. So first of all, we find Paul. Paul, who was living as a willing sacrifice for these people there in Philippi. Now, just to go back on the historical background for just a moment, you remember, Paul is now in Rome. It's a very dangerous situation for him. He's in prison. He has appealed to Caesar. And his trial has not come up yet. But he was also well aware that things might not go well and that this might very well end in his execution and death. And so I think sitting there waiting for the proceedings to grind around to where he could finally bring his case before Caesar, the truth of this idea of being a drink offering came into his mind. Now, both Jewish and pagan Greek religious practice including included this idea of, of wine that would be poured out as a drink offering. It was ceremonial, of course. It might have included some sacrifices. But both pagans and Jews would have been very familiar with the image that Paul makes here of being a drink offering. You know, Paul regarded his own life as a sacrifice. In the interest of the spiritual growth and the well-being of the people that he ministered to, especially in this case, the Philippians. Later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, you don't have to turn to it, it's up here on the screen, but Paul used that same metaphor, this metaphor of suffering that he was going through, and he says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. He knew that his death was probably pretty close. Now, Paul wasn't bitter. He wasn't desperate. I don't think he was despondent by writing those words. I think that he just understood that this was a fact, that his time on earth was probably pretty short. I don't think he had any type of a death wish in any way. But he says that he was glad, that he actually rejoiced, and that the Philippians should rejoice with him as well. And through all of it, as we've noted earlier in chapter 2, his goal was simply to have the mind of Christ. No matter what was going to happen to him, he wanted to have the mind of of Christ. You know, it brings up this whole idea of sacrifice because the truth is very, very few of us, if any of us, will ever have to face the idea of willingly sacrificing our lives. While there are plenty of places around the world where that might be true in terms of martyrdom, and there are Christians who are being martyred throughout the world as we know it today. I really doubt, unless things really change quickly, that that will happen with us here. But it's still something we should think about. And so it raises the question, so for whom or what would you be willing to die? I hope you've thought about that before. Not just as a game with someone, but really given that some thought. Where, where would you draw the line? Who would you die for? 
Would you die for your wife or your husband? Would you die for a son or a daughter? How about a grandchild? Those might be the easier ones to answer. But what about for a friend? Would you give your life willingly for a friend? And so where would you draw that line? Because the whole idea of being a sacrifice is a very powerful idea. God certainly knew that. He gave his son as a sacrifice. On July 1st of 2014, three young high school students, they actually were attending the very high school that I attended in Cedar Rapids, Three high school students went over to an elementary school field one day to throw the frisbee around. Now that seems pretty normal, but you see earlier in the day, it was in the middle of July or the beginning of July, there was one of those summer storms and four inches of rain came down in a matter of just a couple of hours. And then... The sky cleared off, the sun came out, it was beautiful. So they ran to the playground area and they were throwing a frisbee around. The only problem was, right next to the field where they were playing was a very deep ditch, about 10 feet deep. It only ran for about three blocks in that area. It hadn't been covered over yet, but this ditch, received all of the drain water from a huge neighborhood area. And when it rained that much that fast, that ditch would overflow. That's well over 10 feet of water. You think, well, how do you know that? Because I lived right in front of that ditch. And I watched that happen countless times as I was growing up. And whenever it rained like that, we weren't allowed to go out or go anywhere near when that thing filled up with water. The problem was, as they were playing, apparently one of the Frisbees went into that water. And one of the young men, his name was Logan Blake, went to retrieve it, and apparently he slipped and fell in that water. Now normally you would think, well, it... it it's not like a lake or the ocean or anything he could grab on. But the problem was this water, this storm water, was rushing so fast and it all came down to the next street in which there was a culvert. And the culvert is only four and a half feet wide and the water is so high at that point that it doesn't even make a swirling type of a thing to go into the culvert. You can't even see it. He fell in within just a few feet of that culvert and was immediately sucked in. Now one of his friends saw him go under and without thought jumped in to try to save him. Well, that culvert, of which I played in as a kid countless times, it's about 100 yards from my house, used to hide in it, used to play in it. Usually there was hardly any water going through it. That culvert ran underneath the street, and when I played in it, it came back out into an open ditch. It was only about 20 feet long. But by 2014, they had covered over all of the rest of it, and now it opened up into what ended up being first about a six foot, and then an eight foot, and then finally a 10 foot culvert taking all of this water down to the Cedar River. These two boys were sucked under, and they came out two miles later. Now you think, well, nobody could survive that. The first boy did not. 
They found his body the next morning. The second boy who jumped in for him actually survived that. And can you imagine underground for almost two miles? I don't know how much air was in there. He, there would have been floating debris, rushing debris, not knowing when you're ever going to get out of this. He made it through, came out, and when he came out, he was right down near St. Luke's Hospital. <laughs> and he came out, and he was all cut up in a huge mess. He walked into the emergency room. He survived. Now, I tell you that story not only because every time I drive by there, uh, they now, like lots of places where there's been an auto accident, there's a little cross there. And at the time, that was an open culvert with no kind of grate on it of any kind, right next to an elementary school. Well, that got changed real fast. So the next person wouldn't get sucked down through there. But what strikes me in all that, and having played in that countless times with my friends, is if one of my friends had fallen in there, would I have given it no thought and jumped in after him? I don't know. You can't exactly stand there and think about it for a while. Either impulsively do it or not. And that's why it's probably good to think about, so for who, or what, or in what circumstances, would you possibly sacrifice your life for someone else? You know, Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And God used the power of love and the power of sacrifice to save humanity from the penalty of sin. Jesus' life was not taken from him by bad men. It was willingly sacrificed and given for all of us. And so Paul had that willingness himself. And he meant it not to bring attention on himself, but to show himself as an example. An example for each one of us. And at minimum, at minimum, we need to have the same mindset as Paul did. As a willing sacrifice in some way. Well, that brings us to the second example that he brings up here. And the second example is Timothy. So in verses 19 through 24, now he brings up the example of Timothy, who serves as a faithful son. Now, you'll probably remember that he met Timothy on his first missionary journey, recorded in Acts 14. It was probably exactly at that time that this young man, he might have been 16, 17, 18 years old at the time, came to faith, converted, even though we find out later that both his mother and his grandmother were already Christian believers. But Timothy comes to faith. His mother was Jewish. His father was apparently Gentile. And Paul says that he considered this young man like a dearly beloved son. Of course, Paul himself was not married, didn't have any children, but he saw Timothy like a son in the faith. And when Paul then later returned to the cities of Derby and Lystra on his second missionary journey, now he decided that he was going to take Timothy along as a fellow laborer with him on this journey. In a sense, he was going to replace John Mark, who went with him on the first missionary journey, and they parted company. John Mark went with Barnabas. But I want you to notice some of the characteristics that 
that uh, Paul talks about here of this man. First of all, verses 19 and 20 and 21, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Now the first characteristic I see there is that Timothy had a servant's mind. You know, Paul was very concerned about the church there in Philippi. He wanted to send someone back there to convey his concern, to get the facts, how the church was doing, and to come back and report to him. And if you look in Romans chapter 16, <laughs> you'll see that it's like the whole chapter is just a list of names. In fact, there are 26 people that Paul knew firsthand by first name and, and, and says, greet this person and this person and this person. And so there in Rome, there were hundreds of Christians that Paul knew and could have said, hey, would you go back to Philippi, check on the church and come back as soon as you can. And yet out of all those hundreds, he chooses Timothy. <coughs> Because there's no one like Timothy to him. Timothy naturally cared for people. He says that Timothy was one who showed genuine concern for people's needs. He was interested in their physical as well as their spiritual welfare. And so he wanted to send Timothy back to them. You know, it's too bad that the believers in Rome were so engrossed with themselves and their own lives and their own interests that they had no time for this important work of God. Look again at verse 21, for everyone looks out for their own interests. <laughs> wow, not much has changed, has it? But is that also true of us? How often do we get so focused on our own, frankly, trivial things in life that we say no to ministry opportunities when they come our way. You know, could it be that God is actually testing us and our true priorities? And as we're moving through life, God bring some type of a ministry opportunity. Maybe it's only for a moment, a conversation with someone. Maybe it's a longer commitment. But God might be saying, Jeff, are you going to set aside all of your priorities for a moment to deal with this, deal with this person? <laughs> you know, our service will last for eternity. Our service has the prospect of reward at the Bema Seat of Christ. And so you have to ask yourself, are, is God bringing this in front of me? And it's right there in front of me, and, and I'm walking away. Because I have other priorities. <laughs> well, I want you to also note that Timothy had a servant's training. Because in verse 22... He says, but you know that Timothy has proven himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Now, how did Timothy develop this concern for other people? That's generally not natural. And the answer is that he received training to do that. You know, Paul did not just immediately add Timothy as a new believer to his team on the very day that he put his faith in Christ. He let him become part of the church fellowship. He let him grow in his spirituality and his relationship with Christ. And it was only when Paul returned several years later, 
coming across Timothy again and seeing how much Timothy had grown that he finally says, why don't you come with me on this journey? That's when the believers there spoke well of him, Acts chapter 16. And so in other words, Paul was just doing his due diligence. Paul was, can you give me a reference on Timothy, how it's gone for him in the last couple of years? And so even years later, after they had served many years and many miles together, Paul could write to Timothy about the importance of, of being careful to permit new converts to grow and mature in Christ before thrusting them into ministry. Take your Bibles for just a moment. I want to show you this principle. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. He's writing to Timothy. Timothy is now a leader in a church, very likely an elder or pastor. And in chapter 3, he's talking about the qualifications for elders and deacons. Look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 3, 1 Timothy. He says, this possible person to be an elder, he says, he must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Or drop down a little bit further, verse, uh, verse 9, they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested. And then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. And you see, Paul says that he was tested. Paul says that Timothy grew in his faith. He was tested before he was finally taken along in this ministry. You know, Paul understood, I think, the importance of, of getting your roots, your spiritual roots, down deep. And then, of course, he would have been continuing to teach Timothy the word. And he was allowing Timothy, of course, to watch him. To be an example. To ask Timothy to imitate what he's seeing that, that the preaching and the ministry that Paul was doing. You know, that's the same way that Jesus trained his disciples. It's very clear that in the beginning, Jesus first just took those men along and, and he was in a just watch mode. But soon he began giving them opportunities, assignments, finally sending them out two by two, all of them, and saying, when you come back, report back how that all went. You see, he was growing those men to the point where they had the confidence, the skills to do the ministry that he wanted them to do. In the first months of World War II, it was actually late summer of 1940, as Hitler had swept through and very quickly conquered France, he looked across the English Channel and that was his next objective. It was only 20 miles away at the narrow point. And so he knew that he needed air dominance first before he could do a land invasion. And so in the late summer of 1940, it's called what historians call now the Battle of Britain. It was the largest aviation aerial battle in all of history, even to this day. And as Hitler sent waves and waves, thousands of airplanes across the channel to try to subdue and submit them, the English put up their own airplanes, mostly these kind, these little Spitfire airplanes, 
that were a wonderful, quick, fast, great little airplane to dogfight with the Germans. Well, they needed pilots. And as planes would go down, would be destroyed, would crash, pilots would die, they needed a constant supply of more and more and more pilots. They couldn't keep up with it, as ferocious as that battle was. And as that paddle, battle continued on, the RAF learned a very important lesson. And the lesson was this. Poor training combined with inexperience, combined with young men who were eager to prove themselves, equal disaster. Now, they couldn't change the eagerness part. And they really couldn't change the inexperience because the experience only comes from going up and battling. Huh. And so the one component they could change was the training. And so they put in measures to greatly increase the intensity and the length of their training to where they became really the, the very best pilots and ultimately won that battle. Someone else has said this, success occurs when opportunity meets preparation. And that's true not only in all of life, it's true in ministry as well. So what ministry has God been preparing you for? You might be thinking in your own mind, boy, I really could do that or this or whatever it is. I've had training in that area. It, it directly corresponds in some way. And maybe God has been preparing you to do that ministry for your entire life but you've never allowed the door to be open for him to take that skill, that talent, that gift, and to turn it into ministry. So how can you use that for Jesus Christ, for the kingdom, for the church? And if you feel like, well, you know what? I have the eagerness. I don't have a lot of experience, but what I need is the training well, what additional training do you need? And you need to think about, okay, I better not launch into this without that additional training. But whatever it is, God might be calling you into that ministry. Now look at the next set of a couple of verses, verses 23 and 24, because Timothy also had a servant's reward. He goes on and says, I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. You know, God rewarded Timothy for his faithfulness because he allowed Timothy to be Paul's companion for those number of years, even to be his replacement when the great apostle was called home. And Paul himself wanted to go to Philippi. He says, I, I'm confident that that could happen. And yet, he sends Timothy. He sends Timothy in his place. What an honor. What a reward that must have been. Timothy was not only Paul's spiritual son, he was Paul's servant, and now he's Paul's substitute the reward that he received. Well, that's Timothy who served then as a faithful son. That brings up the last example that, that uh, Paul wants to raise here. And that's a man by the name of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus who selflessly risked his life 
for the word. We pick it up at verse 25. Now, before I do that, don't confuse Epaphroditus with another name that's very close to his. This guy, Epaphras, that we read about in Colossians and then again in Philemon. He was a Gentile. This, this man is not the same guy. This man was apparently a member of the church there in Philippi. He had risked his own health and his life to carry a financial gift to Paul in Rome. And now he's getting ready to himself go back. Now I want you to see verse 25 that Epaphroditus was a balanced Christian. Verse 25, he says, But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Now Paul uses a, a threefold description of this man. He calls him his brother, his co-worker, and a fellow soldier. And those three words are important because it shows how balanced he was, how mature he was in his Christian life. You know, some Christians overemphasize maybe the fellowship side of things, the love side of things. And that to the detriment of truth or service. And you can't have just one or the other. It needs to be balanced. Love needs to be balanced with truth. And apparently this man was like that. He was a balanced Christian. He was also burdened because in verse 26, Paul says, For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. You see, like Timothy, Epaphroditus was concerned about other people. And he was concerned about Paul. He had made that long, dangerous trip to Rome. He wanted to stand Paul's side to assist him to bring the church's love offering, church's gift to him. But he was also burdened with his own church. And so after arriving in Rome, he became very ill, and Paul says, even to the point of death. Now, we don't know what he had or what happened to him, but he was ill. And he's more concerned about the believers back home than even his own health. He risked his life. And then thirdly, the last couple of verses, he was a blessed Christian. Verse 28, Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. You know, what a tragedy it is to go through life and never be a blessing to someone else. But Epaphroditus was a blessing to Paul. He stood with him in that prison experience. He, he was there for Paul. And now Paul is admonishing the church in Philippi to, to honor him, to honor anyone else like him too that would do this kind of sacrificial service. And when you think about it, even a guy with a funny name like Epaphroditus is also a blessing to us today. Because he, ex he serves as that example. He proves that a joyful life is a life that's filled with selfless service. It really does work that way. That's what brings joy in God's kingdom. So again, I guess the application of question would be, are you a blessing to anyone? Can you name one person 
who would say, yeah, I am blessed by this person. We all need to be striving in that direction. Well, let me give you just a couple of concluding remarks as we've looked at these three examples. I found this this week and I had to chuckle at it because Mark Twain is so cynical in his quotes. He says, few things are harder to put up with than a good example. <laughs> that sounds exactly like Mark Twain. You know, truly good examples actually can be few and far between. Did you have trouble when you turned to someone this morning and as your mind was racing to pick someone out, did you have trouble finding a name to say has been a good example in spiritual things? Because these three men are the exception. And yet each one of them had characteristics that we can see here and we need to imitate. <laughs> and so I'm going to leave you with this question. Which one do you need to work on the most in your life? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Paul, in writing this personal letter, has given us a glimpse of the men that he worked with, and that as scripture, you also saw it important enough to record, record it for all eternity and to inspire it. Father, for each of these men, whether it be Paul himself or Timothy or Epaphroditus, I pray that we would take away the kinds of attitudes and actions that they had that made them such good examples. Thank you that we have them as those examples. And I pray this morning that each one of us would think about what kind of example are we being to other people around us, even our own family, our kids. Do we expect them to imitate us? And if they imitate us, are they imitating us in the things that you would want? Father, help us as we move forward to think about being those examples now. We thank you in Christ's name.
Jeff and Sherry, we're very thankful that you joined us today. Claire from Colorado, so it's so good to see you guys. So enjoy the fellowship, and we'll see you back in. Thank you.